on this episode of InCycle, the first Rwandan to ride on the World Tour. I was the first Rwanda to sign a contract in cycling, working full time in cycling, just ride, eat, property. It was amazing for me. We visit British track team Hoob Watt Bike in Derby. We always wanted to go to the Olympics, so that's something that we kind of pushed towards and obviously yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So we thought, well, what's the next best step? Well, if you break a load of world records, you sit at the top of the timesheet as world record holders who bought bike. It'd be pretty awesome. But first, the World Championships are on their way to Yorkshire. For centuries, when it came to sport in Yorkshire, the first thing that came to mind would be the tranquility of a game of cricket. But in 2014, that all changed when cycling's biggest race came to town, and with it, a new obsession. As a Yorkshire woman, I'm obviously very proud of kind of the boom in cycling in the last five, six years in Yorkshire. It's always been a cycling county. Uh, there's always been really impressive talents like Beryl Burton um, coming from Yorkshire. But I'd say the community since the Tour de France, the Grand Depart, has really kind of got behind cycling. When announced that Yorkshire would host the 2019 UCI World Championships, it confirmed the area's status as a cycling heartland. And for Yorkshire's most recent world champion, it held more significance than most. When the world was announced for Yorkshire, I was a bit like, wow, this is a long time away. <laughs> um, and I thought, will I still be going then? And I would never have dreamed that I would still be competing and I'd be competing as a mum. The significance goes a step further for Dignan too, with the women's elite road race passing through her hometown of Otley an experience she first enjoyed at the inaugural Women's Tour de Yorkshire in 2016. It's a home world championships in every sense of the word. Like, the way I walk to school is, is the way that I'm gonna ride the world championships and ride past my back garden. And it's just gonna be an incredible experience for me, but also I think for every rider. What every rider can expect is a classic Yorkshire course through lumpy terrain and spectacular scenery. Riders in the 150 kilometer women's elite road race will begin in Bradford before heading through the aforementioned Otley. Shortly after, they'll begin the 1.9 kilometer climb to Norwood Edge, a rise of just 174 meters, but with an average gradient of 9.2%. The bigger test of climbing legs comes some 30k later when the riders hit the much longer loft house, a climb that reaches 18% in its steepest parts. While there'll still be 100 kilometers to go, including three laps of the Harrogate finishing circuit, the two climbs could cause some early damage. Loft houses, it's been raced a couple of times in the Tour de Yorkshire and being a defining moment in our race, even though it was, uh, I think it was over 70 kilometers to go in the Tour de Yorkshire, it's still, the break went from there. So anything can happen, but um, it's, yeah, it's a really tough climb and, and you need to be at the front there if you've got any chance of winning anyway. The men, meanwhile, will set out from Leeds, Yorkshire's largest city, for their 285 kilometer road race. The route is a near carbon copy of stage one of the 2014 Tour de France, including three significant climbs, Cray, Buttertops and Grinton Moor. The only addition is seven laps of the 14 kilometer long Harrogate finishing circuit. With sharp turns and a punchy climb, the loops ensure there'll be no repeat of the bunch sprint seen in 2014, as both the men and women found out when they sampled the circuit at the Tour de Yorkshire. It's lumpy, it's technical, um, it's really important to be at the front. There's a couple of chicanes um, going into quite steep uh, climbs and it's really important to be at the front there. I think if you're anywhere near the back then your race is over. So uh, local knowledge and riding at the, the finished lap a few times I think will come in handy. Mm -hmm. It's a real racers course. Uh, some world championships are based literally on the strongest person going into that race will win it. But this is a little bit of a, it's gonna be very unpredictable. Um, and it's also gonna come down to positioning 
tactics. It's, it's going to be an exciting watch. During the genocide, there, I lost six of my brother and I lost all members of my family. My uncle was a, a best cycling before the genocide. When I went to visit him, he always pushed me, he wanted me to be a cyclist. And I remember some of the words he was told me, because he have uh, seven children and they die in doing the genocide and his wife. And he was telling me, ah, now I stopped cycling. I wish my son was still alive. He can be cycling. After the events of the 1994 Rwandan genocide, Adrian Nyonshuti was left with almost nothing. However, it was Adrian's love of cycling that helped him find a purpose as he went on to join the Rwandan national team and then eventually go on to ride at the world tour level for Team Dimension Data. In 2006, I met Jock Boyer, the one uh, American rider to do Tour de France. And he came over to Rwanda to help the riders. So luckily I met Jock and Everything went well with the difficult things to on, on cycling to get a bike and equipment and eating properly exactly to know what, what the cycling we, we need, you know. Because in Rwanda we, we was no one who had a knowledge about cycling. When I, I signed my first contract, it was really amazing. And it was, you know, like celebrate for me because I was the first Rwanda to sign a contract in cycling and also to move from Rwanda to go out to the country, working full time in cycling, just ride, eat properly. It was amazing for me. After competing at the 2012 London Olympic Games, Nyon Shuti decided to offer the chance for young people in his country to experience the power of cycling. The Adrian Nyonshuti Cycling Academy idea was born, and the first location chosen was his hometown of Rwamagana. We start 2013. We open academy. We have a house. Federation helped me to rent that house for offer the riders food and everything. We have some volunteer they come from England to help the the rider. Most of the riders like now, this year, the riders, they ride two of Rwanda for national team. They've been on my academy. And most of them, they are in Europe. They pass on my academy. So it was the best opportunity for the riders to open the door for them. I try my best to become a best coach or best teacher to help them and, you know, and to encourage them to understand about cycling because the cycling is not just take a bike, enjoy just spin the bike, you think you are done, you are best at cycling because you have to know what time you should be eating, you know, what food is really important for cyclists, what time I should be stretching, all these things. When I'm riding a bike, I feel it's special, something touched to my heart, and I feel uh, cycling is something can help me to forget the past, you know. So when I'm on a bike, it kind of helps me not focusing about why those things, because I'm focusing on my wheel and what I'm doing, the intervals, how I'm riding, and it takes like two minutes just I forget everything. I'm just focusing on a bike.
last two years, who what bike have been busy disrupting the track cycling hierarchy in David versus Goliath fashion. Having set up home in Derby, England, the underdog trade team's pragmatic approach and number crunching ways have helped them quickly become major players on the World Cup scene, winning pursuit medals ahead of some of the strongest national squads. I think, yeah, we definitely played on the David Goliath thing in the early days. I think now it's kind of hard to say. Obviously, we've grown and we've had, we have more commercial support, we have more sponsors, we have more even staff to a certain extent. Okay, people aren't employed, but people want to come and help out. And instead of it just being four lads from Derby, it's kind of exploded into a whole lot more. I think, yeah, relative to the nations, we are still incredibly small. We don't have the support staff and the finance to back that, but we're definitely uh, trying to fight with them head to head rather than trying to throw a little stone at them anymore. <laughs> Why Derby? Uh, I think Derby in general has just been super supportive of us. It's obviously quite central as it goes, and we did look at the velodromes, they're just too far away or too occupied by the Welsh cycling, Scottish cycling, or British cycling. So Derby was perfect for that. We had great support in Hoob, who are Derby based, Watt Bike, who are just across in Nottingham. Uh, the Derbyshire Institute of Sport has been incredibly helpful with everything from SNC, physiotherapy, psychology, just general team support, and we've been able to grow within that network. Even just the local track league, it's, it's a thriving area for track cycling, and um, I think uh, that whole Derby Ayers reputation is, um, is, you know, has really grown and grown. Um, and you know, there's people asking all the time where, where to get t-shirts and you know, go on hoop and get one. It's, it's no issue. All five of us live together. Uh, have we stay in uh, college halls at the moment? We're about to move house actually um, into new digs. But uh, yeah, it's a, a tight relationship with all five of us in one hallway, sharing a kitchen and just living together, training together. Yeah, it's like a, a full 12-month training camp. So obviously that's got highs and lows to it, and um, everyone appreciates different parts of how it works. At the moment, yeah, it's going really well. Unlike their modest living conditions, who what bike success on the track has been far from understated. The Darbados-based squad took Team Pursuit gold at last season's London World Cup, while Scottish sensation John Archibald has since twice set the individual pursuit sea level world record. However, new UCI regulations coming into force for the 2020-21 season could soon restrict their progress. So the UCI changed the regulations um, just within the last few weeks uh, to now exclude um, trade teams such as us and Beat Cycling from competing at World Cups, and they now want to call it a Nations Cup. And trade teams will now only be allowed to compete at Class 1 events, which is a level below, and it's not, um, in terms of what we have been doing, it's, it's nowhere near the level that you, you would expect. Um, so it's a real downer in terms of the, team, the team's progress, because it's just putting us back even further. I mean, originally we couldn't do the Olympics, couldn't do World Championships, couldn't do Europeans, that kind of thing. But now we can't even turn up to World Cups. So the support and the petition has been outrageously good. Uh, it's yeah, in short, it's blown us away. Like the amount of people who obviously see the changes for what they are, and in some ways, it's a bit like what the UCI was trying to do to Graham Ribery back in the day when he brought new ideas. They wanted rid of him, but they couldn't do it as, as straight as they wanted to. They had to find other ways to, to limit his progression, and it sounds pretty much what they're doing now. They're trying to wrap it up with some other excuse that doesn't really stick. Uh, but yeah, the support's been great, and I want people to keep on pushing because it's the only way we can we can keep getting this traction. In the meantime, who what bike have other goals in mind? A series of world record attempts planned for 2020. The world record challenge is quite an exciting one, really. It's we we, we always want to go to the Olympics. So that's something we kind of push towards, and obviously, yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So we thought, well, what's the next best step? Well, if you break a load of world records, you sit at the top of the timesheet as a Tokyo world record holders. Who what bike? It'd be pretty awesome. The general plan at the moment is either Mexico or Bolivia. We're sort of hedging our bets at the moment, speaking with both nations and trying to figure out what would suit best. We pretty much tick most of the boxes in the back end with altitude training, adaptation, and looking towards the physiology side of stuff on what, what's going to hinder us and how do we adapt best towards that. But other than that, it looks yeah pretty much like we can go out there and hopefully break a, a good few records. It'll be the, the team suits the big focus for us. We're our team suit team, and that's what we want. While we're up there, though, the individual pursuit will be the next goal, and I guess there's a bit of a wing it and see the hour record. It may well end up that a couple of us try it. 
because there is really nothing to lose. And um, it's not as though we're pro riders with massive egos that if we don't get it, you know, it's just not the end of the world. Um, it's going to be good fun regardless. And um, I think these, they've egged me as being the, the main threat for it. Um, I mean, at the moment, it's early stages, and I think uh, we're really we're focusing on the team pursuit. That's the, that's the main one we want to get. But then the era has such an attractive well, such an appeal to it that it'd be, be rude not to give it some focus and see how, you know, how close we can get or whether we can. Is it a realistic possibility? Now we go for that. The financial side of the records is, is quite scary in a way. I, I remember back in the media when Victor Campenarts went for the hour record, he said he needed 100,000 euros and people were scoffing and laughing and saying, don't be silly, you don't need that. That is a legitimate amount of money for us. We're doing it on a very tight budget and it's still going to cost us in the region of 60,000 pounds. It is expensive. Um, and it's frustratingly so. I mean, you think, yeah, we can just hop on, hop on a flight to Mexico and ride around the circle if only if it, it was that easy. But there's a lot of uh, yeah, hoops to jump through in the meantime, but we'll get there. and. We're definitely pushing towards it, but I mean, the more support we can have, both financially and commercially, and from spectators and things like that, it just grows us as a brand. It means we can get the support we need to go and attempt these records and hopefully put them on a shelf for some time to come. Born in Whistler, Canada, 15 years ago, the epic mountain biking competition Crankworks has evolved into a multi-stop festival series. What many call the Super Bowl of the sport has become the biggest gathering of the mountain bike community. Crankworks uh, simply is the uh, ultimate experience in mountain biking. It uh, involves all sorts of gravity disciplines of mountain biking, all sorts of athletes participate. It's a, it's a festival of mountain biking, uh, so it's more than just competition, but yeah, it's, it's literally the ultimate experience in mountain biking. Crankworks started uh, back in 2004. It was sort of um, grown out of a couple of different festivals. Uh, that were taking place in Whistler in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. And it was really the organization of uh, the local government, the local tourism association in Whistler Blackcomb coming together to say, hey, let's, let's really put on something, a uh, world-class event that, you know, that back then there wasn't a ton of tourism going on in the early 2000s in the summer in Whistler. And it was really just uh, an opportunity to, to showcase the riding in Whistler to the world. What makes Crankworks different to the other disciplines or any, the other versions of top, you know, world-class mountain biking is that festival component. I mean, every discipline has the best of the best uh, athletes competing in them, but there's just something about the festival atmosphere, um, whether there's music components or multimedia components. I mean, there's competition every day. There's something going on, um, and that's pretty cool. From humble, homegrown beginnings as a small regional race, the now worldwide tour has its own downhill and enduro races, including partnering with the powerhouse that is the Enduro World Series. It's interesting because when we when we partner with Crankworks, that, that kind of partnership's changed quite a lot and, and ultimately two quite independent beasts now that, that really work work in, you know increasingly well together. It used to be there was a lot of crossover in the athletes, but now that the World Series level is, is so high. We're, we're seeing almost almost no crossover because the at the top flight they're just so like specific to the discipline and it's the same with with downhill and, the, and actually all of the team structures it used to be that professional teams would share across the disciplines but now actually the enduro world series is a is a standalone you know career and season for for, for all of the professionals so um, when we join together it's madness because we've both got incredibly hectic schedules but um, it just it just creates this fantastic family and atmosphere. In March of 2015, Crankworks took flight to New Zealand, landing in the lush forests and illustrious dirt of Rotorua, becoming the first Crankworks festival outside of North America and Europe. Since then, it's played host to some of the most memorable moments in Crankworks history. The Rotorua riding scene uh, has developed here, much like riding scenes develop in other destinations all around the world, I think, in that we have uh, this kind of organic, growth that starts with people just going out with a shovel and developing a trail and then bit by bit the word starts to spread and uh, and it just starts to grow like that and I think it's taken off over the last few years. In Rotorua it's it's the mix of we're a year-round destination so it doesn't snow here in winter uh, if it does everyone rushes out up the, up the biggest hill to see it before it melts by lunchtime 
Uh, we've got what we call hero dirt, so we've got porous volcanic soils that absorb uh, rainfall very quickly. And so it, you can have a thundering downpour one day and be riding on awesome trails the following day. Having Crankworks Rotorua uh, here just means that we've got this you know, massive, significant event year on year that the New Zealand riders can come along to and, uh, and really test their medal against the world's best. So I think that, I think that that's, that's often what's missing in our local professional sports people is the exposure to that, that top echelon of, um, of competition. And uh, you know, phys physiologically, technically, you know, I think we can develop those sorts of traits here in all of our sports people, but they, they have to have that tested against the, the challenge of that top tier in order to be competitive on the world stage. So that's what this allows for, um, for our local riders. I always tell uh, the volunteers and the staff at each festival that, you know what, like truly cherish the next five, six days because we know something special is going to happen, we just don't know what it is. And that's just how I feel about it, that every time we get these athletes together at these festivals, something special is going to happen. That's all for this series. Until the next, keep up to date with us on social media.